of the orthography and congruity of the Britanting by Alexander Hume. To write orthographically, they're to be considered the symbol, the thing symbolised, and their congruence. Give me leave, gentle reader, in a new art, to borrow terms incident to the purpose, quilk being defined, will further understanding. The symbol, then, I call the written letter, quilk represents to the E the sound of the mouth so little. The thing symbolised, I call the sound, quilk the mouth utters when the E sees the symbol. This is the ground of all orthography leading the writer from the sound to the symbol and the reader from the symbol to the sound. As, for example, if I were to write God, the titch of the middle of the tongue on the roof of the mouth before the vowel and the top of the tongue on the teeth behind the vowel minds me to write G-O-D. The vowel is judged by the sound, as shall be shouted hereafter. This is the hardest lesson in this treatise and might be called the Kai of orthography. Before I start going through this, a quick reminder, this shape represents the range of vowel sounds that the human vocal tract can produce. Dr. Jeff Lindsay has a fantastic video explaining it, but very roughly, the front or the left corresponds to the tongue being at the front of the mouth, the back corresponds to it being further back in the mouth. So, e, u, a, and everywhere in between. You have monothongs, vowels that stay in one place, e, and diphthongs, vowels that move from one place to another. A. In 1617, a Scottish man called Alexander Hume published a book called Of the Orthography and Congruity of the Britain Tongue. Hume seems to have come from somewhere near Edinburgh. He went to school in Dunbar, between Edinburgh and the English border. He spent some time in southern England as a schoolmaster in Bath. His book describes English from a Scottish schoolmaster's perspective, and he makes a lot of explicit notes about the differences between his own accent and what he calls the southern accent, presumably the one he encountered in southern England. So what does he say? Well, he gives examples of words with each sound in his dialect of English or Scots. I'm going to say Scots for the purposes of this video, but how he thought about it may have been different. He differentiates these words, also mentioning that there's a vowel spelt with the letter O that he doesn't give an example word for. So this is actually a lot more useful than it might seem, because it gives us a good bit of information about the sound categories in his accent. So first, let's compare these sound categories to the ones that they come from in Old English, uh, because most of these words are natively descended from Old English words. This word, tall, comes from an Old English word, tal, and it's distinguished from tail from Old English, talu, which is a tale that you might tell someone, like a story. Now, it might look like this is a preserved distinction between Old English a and a. In actual fact, what's happened in Southern English dialects is that Old English a and a merge together, probably as a low central vowel, a. So all of these words in Old English ended up with that a vowel in Middle English. And then, subsequently, if this a occurs in an open syllable, that is a syllable that ends in a vowel, it lengthens to a long version of itself, a whereas in any other position in a word, it stays as the short vowel, a. I suspect that's what's happened here. So his tail vowel is the descendant of the lengthened a vowel, and his tall vowel is the one that stayed short, a. So is this word then pronounced tal in Hume's accent? Well, in modern Scots and some traditional Northern English dialects, this a-l sequence tends to have turned into something like a, ta, a. See, when gather or the gather, Scots kithed an awe in Orkney and Shetland. Aye, I'm not missing much. You can take off the stuff on the phone nowadays. I'll have your phone and awe. This is separate from the vowel in words like cat, trap. In Old and Middle English, spelling conventions were a lot less rigid and a lot more flexible based on pronunciation. The fact that people chose to spell these words with an A consistently, even though there wasn't a rigid spelling standard yet, suggests that they probably did pronounce them like their cat vowel. Tal, al. And given that Hume doesn't list a separate vowel that's an obvious candidate for the cat and trap vowel, I'd suggest that he still has this Middle English pattern of having the same vowel in tal and al as he does in cat and trap. In modern Scots, the cat and trap vowel is usually a low central a. For various structural reasons, which I'll put on screen if you want to pause and read them, we think this was also the Middle English quality of this vowel. 
so it's reasonable to think that Hume's was probably the same sound as the modern Scots trap vowel. So, trap, cat, tal, al. I'll ignore the tail word for now because it's more complicated, I'll come back to it later. I'll get the other Middle English short vowels out of the way. He lists a vowel in words like hell and l as in elbow. In Old English these had a short vowel with the quality something like e or e. In modern Scots the vowel length distinction of Old English has kind of collapsed into something different which I'll explain later, but the quality is very similar to what it's reconstructed as in Old English so it's simplest to imagine very little change here. If it was e in Old English and it's e in modern Scots, decent chance it was e in Hume's accent as well, or, or something in that ballpark. We can refine this further later on, but for now, unrounded roughly mid-height front vowel, something like e. The vowel in will, in Old English this was willa, with a vowel something like i or i. This is more complicated because in a lot of dialects of modern Scots this has lowered and centralised a fair bit to something like e, eh, well. Again, we'll look at this in more detail later, but my hunch at the moment is that this lowering and centralisation may go back a few centuries because it's something that seems to also exist in Ulster Scots in Northern Ireland. Hume implies that there's a simple sound associated with the letter O, but says barely anything about it. This is presumably the lot and pot vowel, because he doesn't give another example word that's likely to have the lot vowel. In modern Scots this tends to be a mid-height rounded back vowel, something like o. Let's assume that for the time being. The bull and cut vowels are difficult to locate in this list. Historically, the u and a vowels were one and the same across Britain, with a pronunciation something like u. Then in the 1600s we start to see evidence of them splitting apart in southeastern England. Nowadays pretty much all English dialects maintain a separation between the vowel in put, bull and the vowel in cut, run. Except speakers in northern England and parts of the Midlands who pronounce them all the same. So modern Scots actually has this split between the vowel in bull and the vowel in cut and run. Because of the early date of Hume's text, it seems unlikely that there would be a put-cut split yet. And that makes our job easier, because it means that there's only one vowel that we have to find in the list. In modern Scots, there's a merger between the vowel in words like bull and the vowel in words like food. Bull, food. Now this historic vowel in words like food and goose behaves weirdly in the history of northern dialects. That's certainly true in northern England. I suppose the question is, was that true all over Scotland as well? Taking goose as an example word, the Northern English progression seems to have been something like Middle English gorse becomes goose with a fronted version of the vowel, and then that raises, giving a front high rounded vowel, goose, and then eventually that breaks into geese, which while quite rare now, is well recorded in dialect surveys from uh, before the 1970s in Northern England. Hume gives the mouse lexical set as still being different from the food lexical set in his time, from which we're left to conclude that the food and house vowels are both high and rounded, and that food is more front. So that could mean feed hus or feed hus or food hus. This could be narrowed down further. Hume lists another separate vowel in words like mule and muse. In the south, all descriptions point to a diphthong, ew, mule, muse, still heard in Welsh accents today. But Hume says about the letter u, the south, as I have said in the Latin sound of it, pronounces eu, we owe you, both, in my simple judgment, wrong, for these be diphthong sounds, and the sound of a vowel should be simple. If I should judge, the French sound is nearest to the vowel sound as we pronounce it in mule and muse. This is a bit of a confusing description, or at least I find it a bit confusing. The description of the southern sound as eu I'm fine with, that seems to be a decent rendering of ew. But is he saying that Scottish texts tend to use the spelling ou, which isn't very representative of the sound they use? Or is he saying Scottish people pronounce it as if it was ou, which is in some way wrong in his opinion? Well he says pronounce, so that would seem to eliminate the issue, but 
the French sound is nearest the vowel sound as we pronounce it in mule and muse. That seems to be a descriptive account of how people actually pronounce the vowel, not a prescription of how he thinks they should pronounce it. My best interpretation is that he's saying that when people are saying the letter U in isolation, for example when reciting the alphabet, they pronounce it differently to if it were actually in a word on its own. OU is the spelling he gives for his own house vowel, so I'd suggest that he thinks southerners recite the letter as U, as in TRIU, Scots recite it as U, as in HUS, but it should really be pronounced U, as in MUS, because that's an example of a word spelt with just U on its own, so he considers that the purest or simplest sound associated with that letter. This is not the way modern linguists think about sounds or spelling, but it does give us some clues about the framework he's using to describe things. He considers the muse vowel to be a simple one, which seems to mean short and or monothongal, if you look at where else he uses that, that description. If the muse vowel is what he considers to be the simplest quality of the letter U, maybe that means that he'd put words like put and cut in the same category. Otherwise, why wouldn't he use a word from one of those lexical sets as an example? They're almost always just spelt with a U on its own. I won't claim that that's watertight reasoning, but I think it's consistent with how he seems to be describing the rest of the vowel system. So if this muse vowel is indeed a high monothong with lip rounding, where does it stand in relation to the goose and house vowels? Well, I think there are a few reasons for thinking it might be the central one. That goose is goose, that muse and bull are muse, bull, and that house is hoos. For one thing, the Middle English value of the muse vowel was probably ew, a diphthong that glides from i to u, ew. U is a halfway point between those two qualities. If this muse vowel is also the bull vowel, it's worth considering that the bull vowel was short in Middle English and the house vowel and goose vowel were both long. And longer vowels, at least in Germanic languages that I have experience with, tend to be tenser and less central. So I think it's a bit more likely that the bull vowel had centralised to some extent. So, you know, again, this isn't watertight, but I think if we were, you know, using Occam's razor to try and work out the most likely qualities, I'd bet geese, moose, hoos. We'll tackle a couple of what were long vowels in Middle English. In the south of England, the modern vowel in words like eel and heel has a different quality from the short lax vowel in elbow and hell. They're spelt with the same letter because historically in Middle English, the vowel in heel was just a long version of the vowel in hell. Heel, hell. But later on, the vowel in heel raised, making it heel. This is true in modern Scots and modern English. Hume's outline suggests that this is true in his accent as well. He describes a difference in acoustic quality between the heel vowel and the hell vowel, rather than just one being long and one being short. It's by far simplest to assume heel, peel. If you're a historical linguistics person, note that the meat and meat lexical sets look like they might already be merged for Hume, so that meat and meat are pronounced the same as in modern English. So that's one front monothong that we can be quite confident about, e. The vowel in words like while and bite, uh, I would expect to be a diphthong. They are in modern Scots, and this vowel being a diphthong is directly related to the heel vowel being as high as it is, uh, for reasons relating to the great vowel shift. As the heel vowel raised, the while vowel had to change in some way to avoid a merger, and it seems to have changed by diphthongizing. Hume seems to confirm this suspicion, saying that he sees an eye of judgment in one author's decision to spell this vowel with the Greek letters epsilon iota. This spelling could easily represent the a diphthong used by many modern Scots, and something like A is likely to have been an early pronunciation of the price vowel in the south as well. The south of England, that is. The words tail and hole are sort of complicated. Tail is a bit simpler um, in that there's only a few things it's likely to be. It's basically always reconstructed as a monothong in Old and Middle English, and it's a monothong in modern Scots. It has to get from a ah in Middle English to e eh in modern Scots, which is a similar path to what it took in Southern England. In Southern England, we see a lot of evidence for it lagging quite a lot, remaining as a ah into the 1600s, fas, tal, nam, 
and in fact there's a snippet of evidence from Cumbrian that it may still have been lagging a bit in northwestern England, that it may still have been something like ah in the late 1700s for some speakers. Hume doesn't mention any quality difference between long and short ah, so it's perfectly possible that he just distinguishes them by length, tal versus tal. It's possible that the long vowel is already a bit higher, tal versus tail, but I actually lean towards a pure length distinction here for these reasons. The vowel in whole, uh, while a back vowel in standard English, is pretty consistently a front vowel in traditional northern English and Scots. Modern Scots say stein, bein, ain for stone, bone and one, bearing in mind one used to rhyme with stone in standard English as well. So this could just be hail or hell. He seems to push the idea of it being a diphthong, but by diphthong he may mean spelt with two letters rather than consisting of two different qualities in, in, in acoustic terms. He makes a deliberate point of spelling it E-A, with the E first, which he contrasts with the hail vowel that has A first, and I think he actually probably is talking about sounds here. In traditional Northern English, this vowel has often broken into a diphthong, stian, bian, or even as far as stian, bian. Maybe Hume has an early form of this which persisted in Northern England, but has since been replaced with a more conservative monothongal form in Scotland. He could be saying something like, Hail. He gives a vowel in boat, coat, raw, bore. Now this is a bit of a spanner in the works because one might well expect boat to have the same vowel as whole because they had the same vowel in Old English. Actually the same is true of raw and bore. In Old English they were hal, bart, bar. But this vowel before a word final r sound seems to have behaved differently which is why in standard English we now say raw and not rower. Coat is a loan word from French, so it makes sense that it might be in a different lexical set. Um, as for boat, I remember Bouya Brilliot commenting on this in his 1917 treatment of Cumbrian, because it's also a weird outlier in Cumbrian. He suggests that it's a loan from a different dialect. That in Middle English, just as the word coat got loaned from French, perhaps the word boat got loaned from Southern English into an early form of Scots, and that's why it doesn't fit the usual Scots pattern of development. In both Cumbrian development and Scots spelling, this kind of mirrors the whole vowel in being a mid-height vowel that's possibly diphthongized. This could be as it is in modern Scots, something like bought, or it could be like it is in modern Geordie, bought. I'm kind of torn as to which one is more likely, but I'll use bought in my example at the beginning. I've deliberately gone into this from scratch with a very sparse knowledge of Scots history so that the existing research didn't bias me but I now think it's important to compare the conclusions I've come to with the research, which is quite extensive. Robert McCall Miller's book, A History of the Scots Language, seems like a very good compilation of the research. He lists the Aitken word sets of modern Scots. Can we link these sets to the ones Hume puts forward? Broadly, we do seem to be able to, but there's clearly a lot of nuance I've missed. One thing I did know about is the Scottish vowel length rule, and although it's called a rule, it's really a series of rules about when vowels should be pronounced long and short in Scots. So for example, e is pronounced for longer before v, the and z than it is in other situations. Steve with long e, steeple with short e. This is different from the phonemic vowel length pattern of Middle English, where vowel length is word specific. Some words have long vowels and some have short vowels, and you can have a pair of words that are only distinguished by vowel length. Did Hume have the Scottish vowel length rule? Miller says that it emerged in the 1600s, in which case somebody born in the 1500s like Hume might have been unlikely to have it. I think the online Scots Dictionary, which is quite comprehensive, um, suggests that it emerged before the 1560s, in which case Hume might have it. And I think that's based on environment-specific vowel changes that happened uh, and must have been contingent on the vowel length rule. I looked more into the Dictionary of the Scots Language, which I knew existed but hadn't gone into so much to avoid biasing my own conclusions, so I'll do that now and see where we are. It seems like a lot of the very complicated differences between Scots and English lexical sets, that is the things that make the distribution of vowels across words so different between the two languages, have arisen in the last 400 years or so. Um, that's not to say that there weren't quite major points of divergence before then though. The early Scots system listed on the Scots Lead website about 1375 by their reckoning is pretty structurally similar to the late Middle English one. 
As I say, there are lots of little differences at basically every stage of the divergence between English and Scots, so it's always more complicated than I say it is. But broadly, the website doesn't say much about the time scale of the face vowel fronting and raising to e, other than to say some modern Scots dialects haven't even raised that vowel to this day in certain environments. So, for example, wake is still pronounced wak for some speakers. Here is editing Simon admitting another one of his grave mistakes. Um, I didn't realise until I looked at the diagram while I was editing it that the face and stone vowels, which are merged in modern Scots as face stain, seem to have been merged in, in the 1300s um, by, by the reckoning of the, the dictionary. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that the merger happened this early in Scots because uh, in Cumbrian, which is a, a dialect of English that I'm very familiar with, um, that merger hasn't happened. So in, in Cumbrian circa 1900, you, you, you still have a distinction between face and something like stian or stian, um, depending on the speaker. Now, yeah, this, th this says something about Hume's accent because Hume has the Cumbrian pattern of, um, of still distinguishing them at, at, in, in the early 1600s. So that, that leads me to feel even more strongly that Hume's accent is probably more similar to a precursor to modern Geordie and Cumbrian than it is to a precursor to modern Scots. And this, this might seem strange because he's from around Edinburgh, which was obviously a very influential place. Um, but it maybe makes more sense when you consider that London accents of the 1600s sounded kind of like Irish accents now, or West Country accents now. Um, you know, large centres of influence can push dialect features out into the countryside, and then the, the, the cities that are the centre of influence themselves can develop new dialect features while the countryside can, can often retain um, conservative features. So maybe it's a similar thing happening. Maybe the accent that we, we hear in Newcastle and uh, Cumbria and places like that nowadays are not, not obviously fossilised Scots from the 1600s, but maybe, yeah, maybe Edinburgh falls more into a dialect continuum with those than it does with um, with Scots spoken further north, um, still something of a half baked thought, um, but yeah, it's very interesting. I didn't notice that until I saw the diagram just then. The dictionary disagrees with my suggestion that the Muse vowel was a monothong in general, saying it developed more or less the same way as it did in English, going from ew to eventually you. Of course, the dictionary isn't trying to describe Hume's accent and a cultivated Edinburgh accent may not have been in the fray of where the most important sound changes were happening. I think the fact that he specifically compares the Muse vowel to the French value of U suggests that it's a fairly fronted monothong. When thinking about the vowel in Goose and Good, uh, which are the same vowel in Hume's accent, I failed to consider the regional variety in modern Scots. Some speakers, and please correct me if I'm wrong, pronounce them Gis, Gid, some Gis, Gid, and some goose, good, with the lower quality that was probably present in earlier Scots. Maybe it makes more sense that Hume's accent was like many conservative modern accents, that the goose vowel was u, uh, and that the muse vowel was e. Uh. The dictionary pretty robustly has strut as a separate vowel, and it occurs to me that if there had been an earlier merger with the muse set as I suggested for Hume's accent, the later split would probably have dragged a load of words uh, with the muse vowel with it. Muse itself would probably now be pronounced muz, which I'm not aware of anyone saying in Scots, but correct me if I'm wrong. Either Hume has just missed out one of his own vowels by accident, or he has a merger which died out and didn't become widespread in later Scots. I'm leaning towards the latter because he seems to be pretty phonetically aware of his own accent. I now feel less like I'm poking around in an area I know nothing about, and more like I have an alright idea of at least most of his vowel system. So what about the consonants? A lot of things apply in modern Scots that seem to be preservations of Middle English features that I don't think Hume draws obvious attention to, and this might be because they haven't changed in the South yet, so there's no point in drawing attention to it. For example, he doesn't mention that R is pronounced with a tap or trill, era, era, 
which is widespread in modern Scots. And that's probably because a trill was still common in southern England at this point. The modern r sound wasn't widespread yet in the south, um, at least in upper class people's accents. Trills and taps are also the sounds that most European languages associate with the letter R, so maybe he just felt it was obvious how he should pronounce it. He makes clear that it's not a uvular sound, ra, like in modern German and French, because he lists it alongside t and z as being made with the tongue striking on, on the inward teeth. It's fairly common in modern Scots for l to be fairly velarized, l rather than l, although this varies a lot from place to place. Historic Scots show signs of both velarized l and clear l. You can see this through vocalization. Dark l often gets turned into a vowel like u, like how in my accent uh, I sometimes say Susan Calman and sometimes Susan Calman. But clear l often gets turned into y, which seems to happen in West Mid Scots according to the dictionary. Some of the northernmost English dialects like Cumbrian and Geordie have clear l all the time and never velarize it. They say lisp, lilt, fill. Having a fairly clear l seems to be a thing in recordings of 20th century Edinburgh residents, although this kind of thing can completely flip over in the space of 40 or 50 years, so that's not necessarily any indication of Hume's accent. One other thing I would say is that Ulster Scots in Northern Ireland very often has unvelarized l in all positions. And I think the large migration that caused that divergence was in the 1600s. So with the caveat that I don't know that history very well, that could be another point in favour of unvelarized in Hume's accent. I've gone with unvelarized in the reconstruction at the beginning, except in certain environments where it later vocalised. But that's definitely just a balance of probability thing. I've, I've not aspirated plosive consonants like ba, ta and ga, because in traditional dialects, the further north you go in the UK, the less aspirated they are. So I think unaspirated for fairly far northern dialects is probably the safer bet, but I don't know specifically about Hume's accent. I could go on for another hour and possibly only make my reconstructions a tiny bit more accurate, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching. If any Scots are watching, please feel free to point out where I've made mistakes in my comments, especially about modern Scots. Or if there are any Scots linguists out there, feel free to rip this apart. But I felt I'd gone too long without addressing this very interesting language. Alex Foreman has also done some very good reconstructions of um, Scott's texts on his YouTube channel. I think he has a Patreon as well, so I will link those in the description.